For today's Delivering Alpha newsletter, I am joined by Michael Araghetti. He is the CEO and co-founder of Aries Management. Mike, thanks so much for being of here. Of course, great to see you again. Great to see you too, and I'm very much looking forward to the panel at Delivering Alpha as well. on Thursday. I am as well. um, but really to kick things off, let's start big picture macro, because so much has changed since last time you and I had the privilege of sitting down together. Um, rates, mm -hmm. huge driver of your business. Um, where do you see that going in the near term? Do you think we're at peak rates right now? Well, I think the market is telling us we should expect another hike or two, um, and the consensus is building higher for longer. If you remember the last time we spoke, that was our base case. So it's been an interesting year for us because early in the year we felt like we were bucking the trend, but being in the private credit business, two things. One, we get the benefit of rising rates. So it's actually been a really good year from a return perspective and a relative return perspective. But two, we get a lot of data points from the 3,000 portfolio companies that we lend to and invest in. And we've seen fundamental strength despite the, the rise in rates and we are continue, uh, continue to see that. One thing I, I would love to understand better, so you get the benefit of rising rates because the asset is, is floating rate. Right. When rates do, if they do ever, ultimately decline, is that a detractor of return as well? It just seems like yeah, it's, private it's, it's, credit it's a, it's really... It's a fascinating question. So private credit has actually delivered a pretty durable range-bound return. So when rates go up, obviously we get higher return. When rates go down, spreads tend to widen. So if you think about the components of private credit return, it's a combination of fees, call protection, spread, and base rates. And they all tend to move you know, in opposite directions. So somewhat counterintuitively, if rates are coming down, signaling that there's fundamental deterioration in the economy, credit spreads will widen out. So you don't actually wind up giving back the entirety of the base rate. Is there ever a time where private credit doesn't perform? Doesn't feel like it. Doesn't it doesn't feel, feel no. like it. Yeah. And if you look back 10 years, that's definitely the case. But is there a scenario, is there a world that you're preparing for or that you have some extra dry powder on the side for in case that yeah, the, reality comes yeah, to I think the, 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 the reason that it, it performs the way that it does, if you look at the business, whether we're talking about private equity uh, funding or infrastructure lending, real estate, a lot of the people who borrow in the private credit markets are institutional equity investors. And so if you take a corporate credit book, for example, today we're positioned at about 40% loan to value, which means that there's a large sophisticated equity investor below us for 60% of the enterprise value of the company. And so while they're still seeing EBITDA on revenue growth, despite having to absorb inflation and higher rates pressuring debt service, there's still real significant fundamental enterprise value. And I think that's probably one of the things that's most misunderstood about private credit because it's bilateral between a sophisticated equity investor and a lender. So you just don't see the volatility of performance even uh, you know, if you see a slowdown in cash flow. I agree. That is really misunderstood. Um, and obviously with the strong performance of 2022 and, and continuing into 2023, that's led to a, a big boom in fundraising that's continued this year, even as other private asset classes have, have really slowed down. So what's the LP demand picture look like right now for private credit in general? Because there has, given those strong returns, um, there has been just so many new entrants into the space, so much additional competition. Is there still the LP uh, insatiable yeah, demand that we've been Insatiable, it's, it's hard to say it's insatiable, but it's, it's strong. And I think the reason is, particularly when you have an inverted curve, and obviously we're now moving away from that a little bit, private credit, given that it's short duration floating rate, is pulling all of that excess return into the, the asset class. So I think a lot of the LPs are saying, if I can make 12 to 15% in senior secured loans, generally speaking across the private credit landscape, and the economic picture is uncertain, now is not the time to stretch. So you need to see a calibration back on, on rates, and then the equity markets will thaw and you'll start to see transactions pick up. But um, I think it's that, that reality that's driving, you know, driving the, the appetite right now. And then there's just a massive secular trend happening in private credit right now on the heels of the mini banking crisis that we had earlier in the year, which was only six months ago, but it feels like a lifetime ago, and there's a fundamental restructuring of, of the private markets going on, and I think the more forward-thinking LPs are seeing that and wanting to get ahead of it. Restructuring how so? Well, I think if you look, it's, it's been happening for 20 years, so it's funny because we talk about private credit all the time, but there's this idea that it just materialized out of nowhere to be this you know, miraculous high-returning asset, but if you look 
over 20 years, a lot of these loans, real estate, infra, corporate, have been coming out of the banking system for 20 or 30 years. And it's been a function of consolidation, but it's also been a function of regulation, the Basel III framework. So now, you know, if you look pre Pre-GFC, you were probably 18 and a half to 19 percent return on equity for the five largest banks. It's probably half that right now. So there's capital pressure that's happening, and, and most banks, large and small, need to now be a little bit more intentional about their, their capital framework. And what that means is they're looking to people like Aries as a creative partner to deal with the existing issue that's, that's, that's in the balance sheet. So I don't think it's a fundamental restructuring from a credit restructuring standpoint, but there's just a lot of securities that are long duration that need to get resolved in this rate environment, and we can be a very good partner in that. How much of the debt markets do you think are ultimately replaced by cr private credit? I believe Apollo said they see $40 trillion. Is that something you agree with more or more or, or less than that maybe? It, it's so hard to tell and you guys are always trying to get us to throw out ever larger sensational numbers but I think what they're articulating we would agree is at the end of the day the private markets are growing right so there's a big secular trend also to private markets equity and debt taking share from the public markets and as we're growing we just have more tools you know in our toolkit to serve borrowers who need capital from us so through the lens of any credit instrument, now that we all have accumulated so much scale, could theoretically execute in the private market, high grade and, and below investment grade, yeah, it could, it could grow quite substantial, which is why I think there's so much attention being paid to it, right? Given just the, the new entrants and all the competition that's out there, uh, and just the demand for, for lending to, you know, American companies and companies around the world. Have you seen, and let's take areas outside, you know, yep. excluding areas here, but as you look at the competition that's out there, have you seen any kind of deterioration in lending standard or anything that's kind not, of not really. tainted I, the industry at all? No, not really. And I think the asset class is going to prove to be very resilient for the reasons I articulated before. Low attachment point, a lot of equity subordination, and a bilateral relationship with the borrower. So if you look at the liquid credit markets, you have people who come into these assets at different prices. Someone may accumulate a bond position at 50, someone may be in at par, and now they're not aligned. In the private markets, everyone who's in that capital structure is always aligned to the preservation of enterprise value. So in some respects, and I've seen people now putting out research on this, they would expect that structural element of private markets to actually reduce losses in the event that we go through a default cycle in the private market versus the public market. Interesting. Um, and you know, you recently we talked a little bit about the banking crisis. You recently acquired about three and a half billion dollars um, of PacWest asset-backed loans, yeah. which had uh, obviously PacWest had been very volatile in the wake of what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and First Republic. Some were concerned that that would be the next domino to fall. Ultimately, that um, was taken over in a merger transaction. Um, but are you seeing other opportunities out there? Is that kind of the, the last domino to fall? And now that the banking crisis is stemmed, are you seeing additional no, deal think, flow? I wouldn't say that it's stemmed. So back to the conversation about the restructuring of the banking sector, I think by definition, banks will have to deleverage, simplify their balance sheets, reevaluate re which businesses they're in, what's core, what's non-core. And what SVB exposed was the fragility of bank deposits. So when you have fragility of bank deposits and a lot of leverage, that creates mismatches. So the irony of everything that happened earlier in the year is it was not a credit issue, it was a liquidity issue. And part of the challenge is, is as the loan to deposit ratios deteriorated at these banks, they were forced to go into the market and buy longer duration fixed rate securities and their balance sheet got upside down. So the ability for us to come into a situation like that and resolve it either through a reg cap trade where we're giving them relief on some of those longer dated senior secured positions or buy a portfolio of high quality assets or work with them on some kind of a capital partnership where we can fund their client you know, pipeline. Because one of the things that these banks are not going to want to do is give up on their customer franchise. Mm -hmm. But if they can actually partner with us to bring creative capital to that franchise, it's a win-win. And I think the PacWest is just one example of the things that we're doing now. But it's a great example of how it was great for PacWest. They got liquidity at a good price on a high-quality book of assets. It was great for Aries as investors because we were able to generate a very large 
robust return. And what we haven't talked a lot about, which is interesting, is we funded that purchase also with a bank loan financing from another large bank, and it was a win for them too. Which bank was it? Uh, we haven't disclosed that. Oh. Yeah, But it's kind of a three-way partnership, if you will, to resolve that, that very specific problem, and I think you'll begin to see a lot more of that. So you may not necessarily be dancing in the streets with higher regulation and, you know, no, but like I said, you're, I, I, you're partnering with... Yeah, and it's, it's more, you know, I, I've, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I've never felt that we were stealing business from the banks. It's really a function of we do things that the banks can't do the same way they do things that we can't do. So when you look at their exposure to private credit franchises like us, it's increasing over time. And so the story of our growth is actually the story of their growth. In this higher for longer interest rate environment, we've talked about this throughout the years. Um, can you give us a sense and a current picture of your portfolio of borrowers currently? Is the higher for longer interest rates having any impact on balance sheet stress? Have you seen default rates tick up at all, or do you expect to in the future? I would expect default rates to tick up, but not to dangerously high levels. The irony of this moment in time, which is unlike many cycles we've seen before, the stresses are being created by liquidity and high rates, not deteriorating cash flow. So if you look at our publicly traded BDC, which is a very large proxy for private credit performance. We had EBITDA growth in the quarter of about 8%. That was down from 12%, so call it decelerating growth, but still really substantial growth. But the debt service continues to deteriorate as rates go up and stay higher for longer. So yes, if rates stay high for long, you know, through the end of 2024, that debt service will force companies back to the table. But again, defaults are not necessarily a bad thing in the private credit markets. It just means that the two parties come need together. to come together and negotiate what, you know, what the next step needs to be. So As opposed to the syndicated lending correct, environment. where you kind of quickly go through that phase and you're, you're having a much harder restructuring conversation. Yeah, I think that's also yeah. misunderstood yes, about, I, I, about this asset sure. class as well. Yeah. Um, Hopefully we have time for one more question. Um, but you've reportedly, this is this is kind of a fun one, um, you've invested half a billion dollars in Chelsea, the yes. football club. Um, about a month ago, you put an additional 75 million for a total of 225 million yep. in Inter-Miami, which um, has Messi gotten a mania. lot of attention. Yep. Yes, because of <laughs> Messi. Um, and then kind of in the same category, you put a, about a half a billion dollars into Virgin Voyages, which is the cruise line yep. owned by Richard Branson, uh, Virgin Group. Is this a broader bet that experiential consumer spending will remain high regardless of you know what happens in the future in the economy? Yes, it's partially that. So we have a very significant sports media and entertainment investment franchise. At the beginning of COVID, we actually raised about $4 billion to invest in the space. This space is going through a big restructuring as well because up until COVID, institutional capital had a very hard time finding its way into these assets. Prior to COVID though, most of these assets were growing about 15% per year, compound annual for about 20 years. So the values were getting increasingly high, but the, the ability to form capital to support those values was challenged. So we had a thesis that the market would open up to institutional investment catalyzed by COVID. It did. And it did to an extent that we frankly, you know, underappreciated. And so now that we have that expertise and we've built credibility with the leagues and the team owners, we're just seeing that, you know, that flywheel work for us. And I think it is a lot of live content and the value of live content, right? The news, sports, that's what people people watch. And it's it's unscripted and it's it's fun. Um, you know, and then it's really this reawakening or reimagining of how these teams and, and assets need to get funded in order to support the growth. So again, we like to find big secular themes to invest behind. And I think this live unscripted content and value of experience is definitely something that we're going to see more of. Interesting. Well, yeah. Mike Arigetti, thank you so Great much for you. doing this. Absolutely. Great to see you too. Really see you appreciate soon. it. Thanks.